Who do you see that's missing this morning? I don't see Steve and Joyce. I don't see Danny and Denise. Who else do you see that's missing this morning? Evelyn and Paul. Paul here, but Evelyn's not here. Who else? Who? Malice not here. Who else? Okay. Betty and Donna Copeland. Who else? Janie Martin's not here, all right. Okay, Katie Murphy. Pam Dellinger's not here right now. Nathan's not here, all right. Joanne's not here. Who? Tammy Foster's not here. Angela's not here. The Blyes. Who else? Deborah Martin's not here. Roger and Kelly are not here. Anyone else? So what's our responsibility, church? You know, Sondra and I didn't get one call last week from anybody, and we were missing, right? You know? So I want to encourage you. I would encourage you. Be family. Don't make excuses. Be family. Reach out to people as they are missing and say, hey, we missed you. I hope you're okay. Even if you know where they're at, go ahead and say, hey, we missed you. Treat them like family. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, this morning. So especially if they are in your small group, reach out to them and uh, treat them like family. You know why you should treat them like family? Because they are family. Because they are family. If you have your Bible this morning, you might want to open up to Romans 12 and verse 1 as we continue our series of messages on what Paul might say if he wrote a letter to the church at Oklahoma City. I do appreciate uh, Hugh and and, uh, Brandon and uh, Nathan last week sharing uh, truth talks with you, and I hope that was a blessing to you. That was actually uh, something that we saw when we were at the Rewired Men's Conference, and God blessed us through a number of truth talks, they called them man talks there, that we heard there, and uh, so, and we plan to do that more in the future. If it's a blessing to you, we want to continue to do that uh, at at different times, and so I appreciate those fellas. I know that they uh, took it seriously, and they spent a lot of time before the Lord just asking God, what should they say to you? And so I hope that you received it as a word from the Lord last week. I got to watch it on Facebook. I appreciate the Facebook live deal. And uh, and it's also recorded. I actually saw it on a recording. And I was greatly blessed by each one of them and the message that they each brought to us last Sunday morning. So this morning we're going to look at Romans 12.1. Do I know for sure that if Paul was writing to the church at Oklahoma City that he would include this particular verse? No, I don't know that for sure. But as I've prayed about what I think the church would need to hear, this is definitely one of the most important verses that I think we as a church at Western Hills and the church in Oklahoma City needs to hear and needs to take very seriously. So Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Romans, he said this, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So I believe that if Paul was writing today that he would include this particular text in in one way or another. He would say these particular words. Hey, Pam, you were just identified as missing. We're glad that you're here. I want you to know someone recognized that you were missing. And so thanks for coming this morning. And, and so I believe that uh, this text is a very important text. And what I want to do with, for just a few moments is, is unpack it with you. Okay, that's the popular word that's being used today, is unpack. So we're going to unpack this particular verse. And uh, I want you to come to understand it better as we unpack it together. He, says, he started out by saying, I beseech ye, therefore. It could say, therefore I beseech you. That could be the order of it. But this word, therefore, is a word that's pointing back to something. 
Wherever you see the word therefore in the New Testament as you're reading the Bible, know that it's there for a reason. It's pointing back to something. The first 11 chapters of Romans, this verse is in chapter 12, what they are is they're Paul's doctrinal parts of his letter to the Roman church. In other words, he was telling them in the first 11 chapters of Romans what they should believe. In fact, the book of Romans has been called the Constitution of all of Paul's 13 letters. And, and the main part of that constitution is really found in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. He's telling the church, this is what you should believe. It's the doctrinal uh, part of that letter. In chapter 12, Paul begins to begin to give practical instructions. If you want to see it like this, it'd be like Paul was given theology in the first 11 chapters. And when he came to chapter 12, he began to teach on ethics. In other words, here's how you apply what you believe. Here's how you live out what you should believe. He gave practical instructions. Notice the word, therefore, in verse 1. It means that Paul has finished building a case. And that case was built just like a lawyer would build a case with facts. Paul built this case in, in Romans 1 through 11. And now he's going to tell the disciples, here's what you should do with what I have taught you to believe. Here is the practical section. So Paul gave the disciples practical instructions or ethical instructions about how to experience or live out their new life in Christ. And the first thing that he says, he says, along with therefore, he says, I beseech you. I beseech you. This word beseech means to, to call near and listen carefully. If we lived several hundred years ago, there would be a town crier. And if he wanted to get everybody's attention, he would go through the streets of the town and he would say, hear ye, hear ye. And what he was doing, he was calling the people to listen. And when Paul says, I beseech you, he's calling them near. He's calling them, even though he was writing a letter, he's saying to them, listen closely to what I'm about to say to you, I'm getting ready to say to you something that's critical to your Christian life, that's important to your walk with God. So listen very closely. That's what he says when he says, I beseech you. And then he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. It's interesting to me that Paul appeals to them as brethren or brothers. Now, this is used in a generic sense to represent family. It means both brothers and sisters when that word is used in this way in the New Testament. And Paul chose to use this word brethren rather than other words that he could have used. He could have used di disciples. He could have said, I beseech you disciples of Jesus, but he didn't. He could have used the word believers. I beseech you believers in Jesus, but he didn't. He says, I beseech you Brethren, He used this particular word, brethren, over 100 times in his 13 letters. And he used this word for a reason. Jesus considered everyone who does the will of his Father in heaven to be his family. We found that in Matthew 12, 48 through 50. There's a story there about how Jesus' natural family, his brothers and sisters and his mother, were outside waiting on him, and someone announced to him, look, your family's outside. Basically, he said, no, my family's right here, is what he said. He said that anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven, that is my brother, my sister, my mother, my, my family. It was the will of the Father that we should believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was and is called the firstborn brother of many brethren. Done the will of God by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have become the children of God. To Paul, this idea about family, when he calls the church my brethren, wasn't just a positional truth that one day would be fulfilled or become a reality in heaven. This was real on earth to Paul. 
This was his family, and he lived it. He practiced it. Paul loved every believer like they were his family because they were his family. To the early church, uh, which Jack referred to this morning when he said this is the day of Pentecost. So this was the day that the church was officially born. This is the anniversary of the birth of the church when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon those first 120 believers in Jesus. And that number quickly grew to 3,120 as they preached the gospel, as Peter preached the gospel to the multitudes. 3,000 were saved and baptized. And so the little church of 120 grew to 3,120 in one day. In fact, in just a few minutes, it just, boom, it was there. And when he did that, that group of people got the idea, hey, we are family. It wasn't just a positional truth to them. In Acts 2, where the church is, the, the history of the church being born is found in verse 42. Look what happened when these believers heard the gospel. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. What are they doing? They're acting like family. They were all together. And they had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods. And they divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house... They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. They lived this, you see. They believed they were family in the early church. They practiced it. They, they loved every believer like they were their family because they were their family. It was this truth about family that motivated the first church in Acts to be devoted to fellowship with one another. I mean, they were intentional about it. Fellowship with one another. It was this truth about family that motivated the first church in Acts to be devoted to breaking bread with one another, to eating with each other. It was this truth that motivated the first church in Acts to be devoted to prayer with one another and being genuinely concerned about one another's uh, spiritual, emotional, and physical needs. It was this truth that motivated the first church in Acts to sell their possessions to meet one another's needs. You wouldn't do that with anyone else but your family. It was this truth that motivated the first church in Acts to meet daily in the temple and to be devoted to the apostles' doctrine as a family. They wanted to all be upon the same page with each other. They wanted to know what should we believe. We believed in Jesus as our personal Savior and Messiah of the world. What else should we believe? And it was this truth that motivated the first church in Acts to meet daily in homes throughout Jerusalem. They were family. Families love one another. And so Paul loved every believer like they were his family because they were his family. And then Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. And we're going to spend a little bit more time on this one uh, at the end of the message. But just let me introduce this to you. This was by the mercies of God. It, Paul was describing his motivation for what he was about to say. In other words, here I'm going to tell you something. Here's what should motivate you to do what I'm going to instruct you to do. And it's the mercies of God. It was Paul's motivation for sharing what he was sharing. But also, it was to be these believers, these brethren, it was to be their motivation to follow the instructions that Paul was about to give them. Instead of Paul standing up and saying, I beseech ye, brethren, if you really want to be prosperous in life. No, he didn't do that, did he? He said, oh, I beseech ye, brethren, if you really want to be wealthy and healthy in life. No, that's not what he did. He said, I beseech ye, brethren, by the mercies of God. Paul motivated them to follow his instructions by recalling the merciful blessings they had already received in Jesus. And he had already reviewed these blessings in Romans chapter 1 through 11. He'd already built his case 
And, and so now when he said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, he was just alluding to what he'd already said in Romans chapter 1 uh, through chapter 11. And this is what he tells them to do. And now you understand why he's so urgent. He's saying, hear me now, listen to me, brethren. And he's appealing to them based on the mercies of God. He says, present your bodies. He told his brethren what they needed to do to fulfill their calling as disciples of Jesus. He said, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. Guys, can we go ahead and just leave that verse up there and not take it down? Just leave the whole verse up there, Romans 12.1. Would you do that? Because I want them to see it as well as hear it from me. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Paul was using the Jewish ceremonial law as a metaphor to teach his brethren how to live the Christian life. In the Old Testament law, the Jews were required to offer lambs as a sacrifice to atone for their sins. This sacrifice was made on the altar of God, which was at the temple at Jerusalem. The sacrifice being offered was devoted to God. In other words, it wasn't a common lamb. It was separated from the flock. It was dedicated to God's use. It was separated for a particular purpose that was sacred to God. In other words, when anything was separated to God, it was called holy. To be holy means to be set apart exclusively for God's use. And so Paul was appealing to this ceremonial law as a metaphor for what he was about to tell the people to do. Since Jesus had died and atoned for their sins, there was no longer a need for the disciples to sacrifice a lamb to atone for their sins as the Jews had to do in the ceremonial law. But to fulfill their calling as disciples of Jesus, Paul used this particular metaphor as an analogy to encourage the disciples to offer what? To offer their bodies. Just as the lamb was offered to atone for sins, what I want you to do is I want you to offer your bodies to God for God's sacred use. In the same way that a lamb was set apart, set your bodies apart for God's use. Sanctify your body. Set your body apart for God's use. Paul used the word holy, used the word body, I'm sorry, because by it, they would understand when they heard that word body, he's talking about their whole being. Everything about them. Their, their spirit, their soul, and their, their physical nature. They were to offer it all. And so he used this word body to say, offer, present your bodies uh, unto God. To present was not a word. Look at the word present there. It wasn't a word that meant one time for all time. It was a word according to the verb usage, which was to be the normal practice of the disciples. In other words, they were to start presenting their bodies at a point in time, but they were to continue presenting their bodies to God on a regular basis. He said, present your bodies, and he calls it a living sacrifice. And this is what let them know, hey, we're not supposed to kill ourselves as atonement for our sins. No, a living sacrifice in opposition to those dead sacrifices, which they were in the habit of offering while in their Jewish state, Paul urges them to offer their bodies as living sacrifices. And then he says, holy, acceptable to God. The lamb that was offered by the Jews not only was holy because it was set apart for God's use, but it had to be holy in appearance. The lamb had to be without spot. It had to be without blemish. Those shepherds that were going to uh, offer a lamb, they would go out into a flock and they would begin to go through their flocks and begin to look for that lamb that was without spot, without blemish, because that was what God required in the law for a lamb to be offered as an atonement for sins. And so they would go and begin to look for that lamb that was without spot or blemish. Only animals that were without spot or blemish were acceptable to God. While animals could be found without spot or blemish, where could you find people that could be found without spot or blemish? I don't see anyone here that could be offered. <laughs> you all have spots and blemishes. I'm, I'm going to tell you that right here while I'm looking at you. All right? 
So you might be able to find an animal that you could offer without spot or blemish, but where could you find people that could be offered without spot or blemish? Well, in Romans 1 through 11, Paul taught the disciples that when they received Jesus, they were justified by faith, which means that the righteousness of Jesus was credited to every person who believed in him. And they became, by faith, without spot or without blemish. Their sins were forgiven. Their spots and blemishes were removed forever. And because of Jesus, their bodies were what? Holy and acceptable unto God. And then he says to them, not only present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God. Then he says this, which is your reasonable service. Now the word service that's there is the word worship. In other words, if you want to know how to worship God, Romans 12, 1 is where you find the how-to. The way you worship God is just present your body to God as a living sacrifice. You know? I mean, you can, you can go to church and you can lift your hands to God. You can clap your hands. You can sing those songs. But I want you to know that kind of worship is not valuable to God unless you're first offering your body to God as a living sacrifice. That's the way that we worship God. And that's the way Paul was, that's what Paul was instructing each believer to do. Look, here's the way you need to live this Christian life. I've taught you what to believe, but here's what you need to do, and you need to do this all the time. You need to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, and it's your reasonable service of worship. The word reasonable here just simply means common sense. In other words, Paul was saying, look, based upon everything I taught you in the first 11 chapters and based upon the mercies of God, it's just common sense that you should be motivated to offer your body to God as a living sacrifice. Paul said that presenting their bodies a living sacrifice to God was a reasonable way to worship God because, you see it up there at the top, of the mercies of God. Because of the mercies of God. It always goes back to that. You know, we love him because he first loved us. You know, it always goes back to him and his mercy that motivates us to offer ourselves to God. You know, the word mercy means to extend compassion and forgiveness to someone who deserves judgment. And it's something that should characterize us as believers. As those who are followers of Jesus, who is full of mercy, we ourselves should be a light to God's mercy to one another. Hey, do you show mercy to your family members? Well, we're your family members. You should show mercy to us. We, we show mercy to one another, and the world knows that we are disciples by our love for one another. Mercy means to extend compassion and forgiveness to someone who actually deserves judgment. You know, the mercy of God becomes meaningful to you only when you believe that you deserve judgment. I mean, it's mystifying to me in many ways why the church of Jesus Christ in Oklahoma City is characterized by so much sin. And I'm not talking about uh, unintentional. I'm talking about willful practicing of immorality. What is the problem? What's going on? That the church of Jesus Christ can be characterized by blatant immorality in, in a variety of forms that's being practiced on a regular basis by those who are showing up every Sunday and raising their hands to God and worshiping God and saying, he's my Savior. What has happened? What's going on? Where's the motivation to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God? Basically saying, God, I present my body to your will, whatever your will is, is what Paul was saying. Here it is. 
I'm yours because of the mercies of God. You know, one of the things that I've, I've come to conclude, and it's not something that's new to the church in church history, it happens in every generation of the church, is that the church begins to dumb down when it comes to the judgment of God. And here's the problem with that. When you take away the proper view of God's justice and righteousness, what you lose is the motivation that people have when they come to understand God's mercy to follow Jesus. That's what you lose. And so what you have to do is you've got to find another motivation to get people to follow Jesus. So let me tell you how to follow Jesus, you know. If you want to have a better marriage, follow Jesus. If you want to be wealthy, follow Jesus. If you want to be in good shape and be fit, follow Jesus. If you want, I've got to replace the motivation that we should all have that, hey, I've, just been, I've been shown the mercy of God. I don't need anything else to motivate me to present my body a living sacrifice unto God. But that will never be meaningful to you until you first believe that you deserve God's judgment. You know, the Bible contains a collection of stories about God's judgment for sin and sinners. I mean, it's from Genesis to Revelation, this collection of stories. Some of the more popular stories that most of us would know and even people who haven't been churched would know would be like the story of Noah and the flood. You're talking about the world's population being eliminated by God and sparing only eight people. And at that time, the world population could have been as many as six billion. In other words, it could have been the same size as it is today. So think about that. You know? And then we have the story of the Passover, where God's judgment came upon the firstborn of Egypt. And we don't know the, the number of firstborn that died. And God executed the judgment upon those firstborn. And, and, and then we have, for example, the Jews. Here's the chosen people of God who've been delivered from the wilderness. And they're out in the, they've been delivered from Egypt. And they're out wandering in the wilderness. And while they're in the wilderness, they began to betray God. And God sends a judgment upon them in the form of snakes, poisonous snakes. And poisonous snakes began to bite the people. And the people began to die. And we don't know the exact number of people that died. And I want you to know, those are only three of the stories of God's judgment. But you know, the most terrifying story about God's judgment is the final one. And the final judgment of God is found in the book of Revelation in chapter 20 and verses 11 through 15. And the, and the story starts out like this. It says, John is on the island of Patmos and he's having these revelations of the future. And in one of those revelations, God shows him this final judgment. And in that final judgment, John, John says, I, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. And from his face, heaven and earth fled away. And they were no more because there wasn't any other place for them. There was no more room for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before that throne. And books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the people that were standing before God's judgment, they were judged according to their deeds that were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in them, and, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in it. And every person, every person was judged according to their deeds that was written in the books. And then death and Hades were thrown into a lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone whose name was not written in the book of life, which is the Lamb's book of life, was thrown into the lake of fire. The Bible 
is, 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 has all of these of God's judgment, and they all culminate in this last story in Revelation 20, which is called by many the great white throne judgment. And that judgment starts out by, by saying, uh, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, and from his face heaven and earth fled away and they were no more, for was, there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. What surprises me about that particular judgment in Revelation 20 is it says they were standing. And the reason that that surprises me is because in all the other places in the Bible when someone saw God, they didn't stand. They would fall down. And they would fall down, and they would fall down in terror. What would, it, what would it be like for all of us to see God this morning? I mean, I'm talking about with our physical eyes, not the eyes of faith. But what would it be like for all of us this morning if God suddenly made a physical appearance to us? Have you ever heard about something, but when you personally saw it, it was much more impressive than what you had in mind? Well, I experienced this on our vacation last week. You know, I'd never been to San Francisco. And so when I saw the Golden Gate Bridge, when I walked across the Golden Gate Bridge, boy, it was much more impressive. <laughs> you know, you know uh, 11 men died building that bridge. Ten of them died in one accident. But it, it was much more impressive when I saw it in person, you know. And, and then when we went out and uh, we went out to uh, Alcatraz, the prison there, and, and we got off on that island and I began to walk around that island, oh my goodness. I, it's, like I could, it's like I was experiencing what happened, you know, back when the prison was a federal prison. It's, not a, it's a tourist attraction now. I mean, it was much more impressive. I mean, I, I remember the first time I saw the Empire State Building. It was like, whoa. <laughs> you know, I've seen pictures of it. I've seen it in the movies. But when I saw it, it was much more impressive than what I expected. I want you to understand that God is like that. I mean, with my words, what I try to help people do is have the eyes of faith and come to see what God is like. But I want you to know my words really can't capture what God is like. If God would show up here this morning and you could see him physically, oh my goodness, it would be much more impressive than what I could ever describe to you with my words. If God shows up somewhere, the first thing that happens in the Bible is people see their need for mercy. In every account that we have from Genesis to Revelation, when God appeared to men, and there's not a lot of accounts, there's, there's like 13 of them. When God appeared to men, they immediately saw their need for his mercy. They were so impressed by whatever they were experiencing, by whatever they saw, they said, oh my goodness, I need God's mercy. There wasn't any excuses. The Bible says in all of those accounts that the people were terrified. Terrified. If you could think of the time in your life when you were the most fearful, <laughs> it wouldn't compare to what the people were experiencing when they physically saw God. The word fear is used. The word fear means terror. By the way, it doesn't mean reverential awe. Okay, it means it's terrifying. And if we saw God today, it would be terrifying to us. You know, God said to Moses that no man can see my face and live. Isn't that interesting? Job was called the most righteous man on the earth in his time frame. But when Job saw God, what happened? He abhorred himself. 
and he repented in dust and ashes. Gideon saw an angel of God, <laughs> and he thought he was going to be struck dead at any moment. And it just says he saw an angel of God. The parents of Samson, Manoah and his wife, saw an angel of God. Manoah said to his wife, we will surely die because we have seen God. Isaiah saw God. Isaiah was a righteous man by everyone else's account, even by God's account. He's, he's credited with righteousness. But when Isaiah called, saw God, he was overcome by feelings of terror. And he said, I am ruined, is what he said. I am ruined. Daniel saw God. We all think of Daniel as being such a great man of God. But Daniel saw God. And when Daniel saw God, he lost all the strength in his body and he fell face down to the ground. We have many accounts in the Gospels where the disciples were suddenly aware that Jesus was God. For example, they were fishing one day and, and Peter became aware that Jesus was God because of this miracle that Jesus performed. And he fell at the feet of Jesus and he said, depart from me for I am a sinful man. He didn't make any excuses. He saw his need for mercy. Peter, James, and John saw Jesus transfigured into his glorified state and they heard the voice of God the Father and they were terrified and they fell with their face to the ground. Because they knew they were in the presence of God. Even soldiers that came to arrest Jesus. When Jesus identified himself, they, they said, we're looking for Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm, I am he. They drew back and they fell down in fear. When the apostle Paul saw the glorified Jesus for the first time on the road to Damascus, he was terrified and he fell down. When the apostle John saw Jesus glorified in the book of Revelation. He was terrified, and he fell down at his feet as a dead man. In the Bible, in both the Old and the New Testament, both before and after Jesus died, when people saw God, they were terrified. And they immediately, they immediately understood their need for mercy. When Jesus returns at the end of the age, the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. No more excuses. There will be some, the Bible says, that they crawl into the rocks and ask the rocks to fall on them and hide them. You see, when you see God, you see your need for God's mercy. And what's happening today in the preaching of the gospel is we're not preaching the truths about God that cause men to really see their need for God's mercy. And the result of that is there's no motivation. You've got to give them motivation. You've got to give them self-help motivation to follow Jesus instead of just, hey, you've been shown the mercy of God. That's what Paul said. Now present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Let me ask you a question, and I want you to be really honest. Have you really ever seen your need for the mercy of God? You see, the Holy Spirit was given, Jesus said, to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, you've never seen God physically, and neither have I. But have the eyes of your faith been opened up to, in such a way that through the eyes of faith you saw God and his righteousness and you said, I need mercy. I need mercy. Have you ever experienced the terror of God before in your life? Let me tell you something. If you've never experienced the fear and the terror of God before, because by the eyes of faith, not by your physical eyes, but by the eyes of faith, you saw God in such a way that you'd never seen him before, and you were terrified of what was going to happen to you. Where are you really at spiritually? Have you really seen your need for mercy? 
Have you seen your need for mercy and cried out to God for mercy in faith that Jesus Christ has provided that mercy for you? Because when that happens, when you really see God and you really experience the mercy of God through Jesus Christ and you realize, oh, Jesus died for me or I would have died. Let's go, oh, here I am, Lord. Here I am. What did Isaiah do? After God appeared to him, he said, oh, man, I'm ruined. He fell face down. I'm ruined. And then God uh, sent this unbelievable creature that I can't even describe to you, and he took a burning coal from the altar of God, and he touched Isaiah's lips, and he purified Isaiah by touching him. It was a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do. It's not that we touch God, it's that God touches us through Jesus, and he purifies us, and we receive the mercy of God. And what was Isaiah's response to that? I mean, just a moment ago, he was like, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And all of a sudden, God comes, and, and this creature takes this, this, this coal and, and touches him and purifies him, shows him mercy, mercy he didn't deserve, and he knew it. You know what his first response is? Lord, here am I, send me. You see, that's what happens. When you experience the mercy of God, the battle over who's going to be the Lord of your life is over. But if you've never experienced the mercy of God because you've never really seen God through the eyes of faith and understood the judgment of God, have you ever been converted? What did you receive? When you prayed that prayer or you went through the waters of baptism, what did you receive? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, church, at your reasonable service. Let's pray together. As we pray right now, I just, I'm so concerned about the condition of the church of Jesus Christ. I'm so concerned about its, its members. Where do we really stand? Have we really experienced God in such a way that we're, we're so humbled by the presence of God that we know, oh, I need your mercy. I need your mercy. Do you know that? Have you ever experienced that? You know, I, I would just encourage you, don't take a risk here. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. There's no salvation apart from the fear of God. It starts with the fear of God. When God reveals himself to you and through the eyes of faith in such a way, you go, I'm ruined. I'm ruined. I deserve the judgment of God. There's no judgments that's too bad for me because I have seen the righteousness of God. Are you sure about where you stand? On this day of Pentecost, is perhaps today is the day of your salvation. Do you need to receive the mercy of God through Jesus Christ? Because right now the Holy Spirit is showing you who God is in a way that you've never seen Him before. Oh, you've used the word holy. But you really haven't understood what that meant. That God in his righteousness is so perfect and he's so pure that you can't stand in his presence.
God is so righteous and he's so pure and he's so perfect and he's so holy that you can't live in his presence. There's not a place for you with God when you see God for who he's like and what he's really like. I need Jesus. He's the only way. He's the only way I'm going to be saved. How about you? Have you really received him? Have you received God's mercy? During our prayer time this morning, I want to give you the opportunity to receive Jesus. And so I want to invite you to come just right here to where I'm at. Let me or someone on our team talk to you about your soul and the condition of your soul. And then this prayer time is, is also for other needs. We've, we've got Justin Warner leaving for Africa. and We've got a team and a group of students leaving for Falls Creek. And then there's Deborah Martin and Terry's really in a bad place this morning. And that family needs our prayers. And then there's so many others that are not in a good place that need prayer this morning. So this prayer time is, is for all of those needs. But the most important thing is, do you know that you know that you have received the mercy of God through Jesus Christ for your salvation? Because you have seen God through the eyes of faith. That's the most important thing. And if you don't know for, that you know, please come this morning. Don't, don't live another moment without knowing Jesus for who he really is. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Father, I pray for your blessing on this prayer time. You are so holy. You're so righteous. You're so pure. You're so perfect. There's none that can compare to you, God. We need your mercy through Jesus. Oh, we need your mercy, Lord. Just meet with us. As you met with the early church on the day of Pentecost, during this prayer time, meet with us now. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. I invite you to come for prayer, to come for salvation. Would you come at this time? And if you want to pray with those that are coming, then come up and join them if you would.